I truly am glad to have you again in our lesson this morning in this working our way through the the book of Acts and we're in chapter 5 and we're going to look at sort of the result the the fallout that takes place after this whole episode and event with Ananias and Sapphira we'll start in uh, verse 12 of Acts, but uh, Acts 5. Let's join together in prayer before we get into the Word. Father, as always, we uh, cannot rely upon our own understanding, our own knowledge, our own categories, our own abilities. Uh, we must trust you and depend upon you, and so we do so now, and we ask for you to speak. You are a speaking God and an acting God. And we pray that you would speak to our lives and to our hearts your word to strengthen us, to comfort us, to correct us, to compel us to live out and make known the good news of Jesus Christ. So help us now, we ask in your name, Lord. Amen. All right, so Acts chapter 5, starting in verse 12. Now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. And they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Now, this is a, another summary that we run into in the very early chapters of, of Acts. Uh, we've had uh, three great summaries now, including this one. The first comes in verse uh, verses 42 and through 47 of chapter 2. And in that, we have a summary that describes the, the incredible devotion uh, of this community, this fellowship of disciples. The second uh, great summary, an early summary of that's going on is in chapter 4, verses 32 through 35. We just got done looking at that uh, a number of lessons ago, and this describes the, the generosity that was uh, widespread among the fellowship of believers, that there was not a needy one among them. And then we have this one, and this one uh, not only, but especially highlights the power-filled nature of this believing community of disciples. So we've got devotion, generosity, and power. And, and oh, that we would be in our day those that experienced as the people of God the, the devotedness, the, the unity, the connectedness, the generosity, and also then the, the manifestation of the power of the, the Holy Spirit in us and through us. Now, looking at this passage, it's interesting. You know, some things jump out as I was uh, looking at this and preparing and studying ahead of time. It starts out in verse 12, and, and really verses 12 and, and a little bit of 13, maybe even 14 kind of summary stuff here. But it starts out now, many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. This is not something that is now even just extraordinary. It's, it's kind of a common occurrence that miraculous uh, works are being done by the apostles. And what we should see here is the Holy Spirit is continuing in and through the apostles and the, the church, the believing fellowship of disciples, there is this continuation by the Holy Spirit of the ministry and the work of Jesus. Now, we talk a lot in our day about the example of Jesus. We talk about the ministry of Jesus. We talk about the, the acts and the, the deeds and the works of Jesus, that, that he was an incredible example. And, and he is a, a really a noble and worthy example that we are to follow, but we follow first by having a relationship with him. And he is the one that does these things in us. And so it's the Holy Spirit that's working mightily uh, in this believing fellowship and community of disciples and through the apostles especially so that signs and wonder, wonders are doing. And then it goes on and describes that they were all together 
and Solomon's portico. So they continued to gather regularly at the temple. They've been warned not to speak of this name of Jesus and spread the way or even to gather as they are, but, but they continue to do so. And it says in verse 13, none of the rest dared, dared to join them, but the people held them in high esteem. And so we have this, this kind of juxtaposition. And there's a lot of interesting uh, thoughts that commentators have about this. I'm going to kind of give you, you know, where, where I fall down on this. But so the the, the apostles are gathering boldly and fearlessly in Solomon's portico, continuing to gather publicly, minister, speak, heal, teach, lead people to Jesus. The, the believing fellowship, the believers are a little more hesitant to gather so regularly in public. It's not to say that they aren't, but, but by and large, they are not gathering with them. Uh, and and all the people, not just in the church, but in the in the wider culture, the the, the Jews and the, and the Greeks that were in Jerusalem, the surrounding area, it says that they they held them in high esteem. There was this uh, elevated reverence and respect for them. And the result of all of this, the miracles, the healing of signs and wonders. The, uh, the boldness and fearlessness that they would be out in public proclaiming, even as it is against the, uh, the mandate of the Jewish religious leaders. They're continuing to proclaim Jesus. Um, they're held in high esteem, which means they're respected and revered. They're not necessarily, uh, uh, people aren't uh, necessarily all believing in Jesus, but they're like, wow, you know, those, those are some pretty great guys. You know, it's great that they believe what they believe, but we're not necessarily on board with that. That, that might be a little bit what's going on. But we see here, verse 14 clarifies this. It says, more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. Verse 14 is telling us that the gospel, by the work of the Holy Spirit, through the apostles and the believing fellowship that was devoted to one another, that was generous, and that was a power-filled fellowship, the Holy Spirit is ministering and bringing more and more people to a saving knowledge and relationship with Jesus Christ. More and more people are being added to their multitude, uh, to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. Uh, the, the One of the things that is going on between those that are hesitant and those that are flocking is the the impact. Ananias and Sapphira sent shockwaves, not just through the church, but sent shockwaves through the wider culture as word got out about what transpired. And so um, there were people that were hesitant to join the fellowship of believers without truly trust, trusting Jesus. In other words, casual, curious people were less likely to be part of this fellowship. And those who were all in, those who genuinely were touched and transformed by the Holy Spirit and the saving grace of Jesus Christ, did gather. And that's what's going on here in verse 14 is the, the addition the multiplication of the number of the disciples. And so verse 15 goes on and talks about how these signs and wonders, how incredible and powerful they were. It says, so that even uh, they even carried out the sick into the street and they laid them in cots and mats, that even Peter, if his shadow could just cast across them, that they might be touched and blessed by Peter. And it says in verse 16, a great summary of all of this power manifesting in the early church. The people also gathered from towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Like Jesus, when people would come and, and, and they would know he was in town, they would flock to him. Now people are coming in from the, the countrysides and so forth, and they are flocking to Peter. They're flocking to the apostles. They're flocking to the church so that those who are both physically and spiritually sick were healed. Those that were physically ill or broken or uh, paralyzed were physically healed and those that were in a state of sinful separation from God were coming to believing faith in Jesus and were spiritually healed. What an incredible summary. What an incredible work that God was doing in the early church. And what an incredible work that God, I believe, can still do in our day. 
But it's so important that we be like these summary statements, that we be a devoted fellowship where we can really, truly count on one another, where we are really, truly committed to the community of disciples. That there would be a generosity among this believing fellowship devoted to one another. Generosity whereby we didn't see what is ours only as ours, but available by the move of God in our hearts to share with others. And this devotion and generosity is one of the ways that the the conduit and the, the pathways of God's power by the Holy Spirit in us can flow freely. There is a connection. Maybe one of the reasons why we don't see God move in such a powerful way today is we have such a weakened understanding and commitment of devotion that we, we are really struggling with worldliness. We, we, we battle the, the keeping and the collecting of our stuff, but not being willing to freely and generously share with those in need. And as those sold out and generous with, with and for Jesus, the power of the Spirit works in us. This is what I pray for, for our churches in our day. And this is what the culture needs. This is what our world needs. They need to know Jesus. And they need to see a community of followers of Jesus who, who really embody, who really take this, this gospel seriously. And this gospel seriously touches and transforms and shapes and drives and forms and empowers our life together. Brothers and sisters, this, this is the call. This is the call uh, to, to, uh, for us to be these kinds of disciples. And it reminds me of what uh, Jesus himself taught when he was uh, preaching and teaching in Luke chapter 14, starting in verse 25. Again, it says, Now great crowds accompanied him and turned and said to him, uh, and, and he turned to them and said to them, and this great crowds, remember, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not despise his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, they cannot be my disciple. Now, the hating and despising here is not to, to uh, say that it's unimportant, but he, what he's trying to do is in such dramatic words and, and concepts and phrases, he's trying to get us to understand that our commitment to Jesus must be the primary commitment that redefines every other commitment. Our relationship to Jesus must be the primary relationship that redefines every other relationship we have. And so he goes on and says, Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first down, sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it, Otherwise, when he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to encounter another king in war will not sit down and first deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any of you who do not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. We see in the early church those who are willing to give up their total rights to self for the sake of Christ and for the good of others. This, this is the call to discipleship. And this is what characterized the early church. And this is what should challenge us. It certainly challenges me, even as I'm sitting in front of this camera and, and sharing these words with you. And as you're watching this video, I do so with fear and trembling because this is an awesome call. I love how uh, C.T. Studd once said is, Jesus is not Lord at all until he is Lord of all. And what a, what a great summary that is, that he is not Lord at all. In other words, he's not truly Lord in our life. And he's, till he's Lord of all of our life. Let's pray. Lord, we are a divided people, individually, communally. 
because we're conflicted. We have such competing interests and such competing internal desires and drives. And I pray, Lord, that you would bring all of these various interests and desires and pursuits and passions. And Lord, make it in our lives individually and collectively. Make it you. Stir and so strengthen us that you would be the chief desire of our life that you would truly be Lord of all in us. And Lord, that there would be such devotion and generosity and power in and among and through us as your people. Oh, we pray that you would do this, Lord, and do what it takes in us. Do what it takes in us to bring us to this place, to this kind of relationship with you and to this kind of way of life together and as witnesses to the gospel. To our neighbors and the nations, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, may the Lord work mightily this, this truth, this word, this message in your heart. I eagerly look forward to being with you again tomorrow.